Hello, um, welcome to the ESRC Festival of Social Science. Uh, my name's uh, James Brown. I work at the Warwick Institute of Engagement, and it's a real pleasure um, to have you joining us for this uh, this event all about mapping women's suffrage. Um, normally, we would be out there uh, in the real world, so it's a little bit different for us to be sat here in our spare rooms and our offices uh, talking to you uh, via YouTube, but um, it does mean that um, you can all join us from the comfort of your own home. Um, and in fact, there's a, a great audience out there. And I know that uh, you're all joining us from loads of really exciting places. So um, please do get involved in the chat, type in your questions for the speakers um, and do let us know where you're tuning in from as well. Uh, I'm joining you from Birmingham uh, and I can just sort of hear fireworks popping in the background. So hopefully uh, they don't distract too much. Uh, but yeah, do let us know where you're joining us from. Um, make sure you put loads of questions in. So we want your questions. We want to be able to respond to you as we go through the event. Um, but that's probably enough from me. Um, do get involved as well if you're on Twitter. Uh, you can use the hashtag ESRC Festival um, and you can follow us at Warwick Engages. Uh, but now I'd uh, like to introduce um, our chair for the evening. It's uh, Professor Sarah Richardson, uh, who is a professor at Warwick, uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, she's going to chair events um, for the rest of the session, so I'll uh, pass over to Sarah and let her uh, explain how everything is going to uh, carry on. Great, thanks very much James and welcome everyone to the first in a week-long series of events which is based around the Mapping Women's Suffrage Project. This launch event is going to focus on research in your family or local suffrage history and it's obviously a momentous day today for democracy with um, the election, the final election of Joe Biden um, winning over Donald Trump a few, mi few minutes ago, I think. Um, so I think that uh, the fight to vote and the importance of getting out to vote um, is more important than ever before. And Mapping's Women's Suffrage seeks to celebrate those women who fought to gain the vote at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century. But the narrative of, the, of women's suffrage often focuses on the leaders, focuses on what was happening in London and forgets the local stories. There were hundreds of thousands of men and women all over the country fighting to gain the vote, campaigning out on the streets and petitioning um, so wherever you are, if you're in Britain or across the world, you will have had people campaigning for women to get the vote on the streets um, and uh, in your local communities, in your villages, in your towns and in your cities. So this event is going to bring together um, two local history and family researchers. Margaret Scott and Claire Witchbold, alongside Tara Morton, who is the project coordinator for the Mapping Women's Suffrage Project. And Tara is going to start by introducing um, the project and uh, how it speaks to uh, family history and local history across the country. Um, Tara is the creator of the Mapping Women's Suffrage Project. And her research interests include 19th and 20th century feminism, women and visual culture, space and gender politics. Tara is going to give an overview of mapping women's suffrage and highlight our collaboration with local history researchers across the country. So I'll hand over to you now, Tara. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that introduction. Um, hi everyone, welcome to our first uh, live launch event. Um, as Sarah said, I'm Tara Morton, I'm Project Coordinator for Mapping Women's Suffrage. And I'm going to spend really just the next few minutes um, talking to you about the Mapping Women's Suffrage project, um, uh, its aims and its context, which not all of you may be so familiar with, um, as well as highlighting, of course, the immense value to us of um, local and family suffrage research. Um, I think it's important to start off really by remembering that by the time we get to 1911, uh, when the uh, Mapping Women's Suffrage Project is set, that women had been campaigning for the vote in a nationally organised way for almost 50 years. 
Um, and of course, they didn't get the vote, also only some women got the vote in 1918, uh, if they were aged over 30 and they fulfilled certain property qualifications. And of course, they didn't get the vote on the same terms as men until a decade later in 1928. Now, during those years, of course, many different suffrage societies emerged, and there was also a shift in the way that some women campaigned for the vote. Um, and if I could ask James for the first slide, please. Um, we had uh, peaceful, uh, law-abiding societies like the National Union, uh, led by Mrs. Millicent Fawcett, which continued to advocate those sort of long-standing, peaceful methods of campaigning for the vote that suffragists had engaged in for a long time. And these were things like organising large petitions, lobbying MPs, essentially to persuade the government to grant women the vote. And if I could have my next slide, please. Um, of course, there was a huge range uh, from these peaceable societies like the National Union um, through to those who understandably became frustrated with the lack of progress um, and turned to a more sort of radical way of thinking about challenging um, for the vote and bringing in new tactics, often violent tactics to try and force the government's hand to granting women the vote. And of course, this tactic has become synonymous with uh, Mrs. Emmeline Pankhurst's Women's Social and Political Union, or WSPU, whose members, of course, became known as suffragettes. And of course, I think it's important to emphasise that there were many, many shades of suffrage societies between these two. Uh, and of course, even suffrage politics for individual women differed, even within the same suffrage society. So it's important to remember this was a very complex, not a simplistic movement. Um, now, that said, um, there has been a shift in recent years to uh, more nuanced approaches towards the Votes of Women campaign and how it's represented. But I think it's fair to say that in terms of um, popular representation, so whether we're thinking about film or whether we're thinking about television or popular books, as I've sort of tried to illustrate in the bottom um, right hand corner of the slide here, um, popular um, interpretation still focus very much on um, the dramatic deeds, if you like, of the suffragettes. And of course, when we talk about those deeds, we're talking about acts of mass vandalism, we're talking about raids on the Houses of Parliament, um, we're talking about arson, even bombings, arrests and imprisonments. And of course, we're also talking, as Sarah mentioned earlier, really about focusing on London, because that's where many of these dramatic, um, spectacular and violent acts of political protest took place. Now, of course, these are fascinating, rich and dramatic stories um, at the geographic heart of British politics. Yet, as Sarah also mentioned earlier, you know, women campaigned for the vote all across the country in the communities where they lived and where they worked and, and lived their lives every single day. So whether it was um, suffragettes setting fire to um, you know, local pillar boxes in a sleepy town like Leamington Spa in Warwickshire, um, or whether it was more moderate suffragists organizing afternoon teas um, to bring politically like-minded uh, women together in Leeds. It's the lives of these sort of ordinary women, if you like, alongside the more sort of renowned campaigners and leaders of the movement that Mapping Women's Suffrage really wants to sort of focus on um, and to um, bring to the, to the wider public. And of course, to do that, we have to identify them and recover them. We have to plot and record them and ultimately to share them through our map, because it's often these ordinary women whose lives and materials, you know, such as the photographs, letters, diaries, etc., um, still often hidden from wider public view, whether that be in, you know, sort of family or grandma's attic, uh, or whether that be sort of buried away in regional archives somewhere, or whether it be that there's actually quite an abundance of materials about them, but these materials might be scattered far and wide between different physical locations, between different online locations, and sometimes it's difficult to pull them together and to find them easily. Um, there's often a real tension there between local and national archives. So what our map really does is enables us to bring together the local and the national, um, whether that be in 
with people uh, or with materials and makes them easy to access simply by clicking on someone in your street or your town, uh, which of course will become um, more easy to do as the sort of map becomes more populated as we head towards our aim of achieving it uh, for the centenary of um, 2028 when women got the vote on the same terms as men. Now, so far, we've already had some wonderful interactions between the local and the national and between people. And to try and sort of illustrate that, um, what I'd like to do, if I can, is put up my next slide, um, which is a campaigner that we have as an entry on our map, a lady called Edith Bevan. Thanks, James. So on this slide here, this is an entry for our map on Edith Bevan. And you can see Edith, I don't know if you can see that little photograph of the people just in the top right hand, uh, left hand corner there sorry um she's just in the hat in the slightly darker hat in the center of the photograph there now edith was a campaigner with uh, mrs millicent Fawcett's national union of women's suffrage societies and she actually co-founded a local society in sussex called the cookfield women's suffrage society now, what was great about this entry uh, for Edith on our map is that we were able to bring together several people and several sources. So, for example, we were able to bring in biographical information about Edith from a suffrage researcher and writer in Sussex called Frances Stenlake. And she provided much of the biographical information about Edith for us. But then we were also, through our wonderful partnership with the National Archives, able to bring in Edith census records for 1911, which of course pinpoints to us where she was living uh, that year, hence where she needs to be put on the map. And then we were also able and were contacted by um, the wonderful Sue Burgess at Cookfield Museum, the local museum there. And she was able in turn to provide us with these wonderful photographs of Horsgate House, which is where Edith was living in 1911 when the census was taken. And in the center of the slide at the bottom there, you can just see an old photograph um, of Horsegate House that Sue was able to give to us. And also a lovely modern photograph of the house, which obviously still survives, which is in the top right hand corner there. But what we were also able to do is also to bring in sort of local uh, characterful photographs from Cookfield, courtesy of the Cookfield Museum too. And so that slide, for example, that you can see there um, in the bottom right hand corner is actually the central Sussex suffragists. That's quite a, a mouthful. Um, and what you can see there is them sort of gathering on their way to London to take part in the uh, women's suffrage pilgrimage that uh, took place in 1913 and was organised by the National Union. Now, Edith played a key role in sort of getting this together and helping to organise local suffragists. And it's actually believed and highly probable that this sort of group that you can see here made an overnight stay at Edith's house in Horsgate, the picture which you can see there, um, on their way down to this huge gathering for this pilgrimage that took place in 1913. So I think what I'm really trying to illustrate with Edith Sentry as an example is how our map can work to, to bring people together. So we've got researchers coming together. We've got local museum curators coming together and we've got national archives coming together. And we're centralizing all of this knowledge, all of this information and all of these wonderful materials in one sort of easy clickable place on the map. Um, and that's really the aim, the central aim of our project. Um, and I think if I could have the final slide, please, James. Um, what this shows as well is the importance to us and to our projects of local and family suffrage research. So since we added Edith uh, and her entry to the map, as you can see, we've had more information about other suffrage uh, campaigners from Francis Stenlake and others. And so gradually in this little corner of Sussex, we're beginning to build up this local map of suffrage activity. But importantly for us as well, what that's also doing in turn is helping us to build up this picture of national campaigning, because this is what we want to replicate in towns, villages and cities across the country. We want to show the level of campaigning and the type of campaigning that was going on. And of course, the type of women that were taking part in it. I'd like to quickly say at this stage that, of course, Mapping Women's Suffrage is an ethical project. Um, so 
anyone that contributes information and material like this to us gets um, credited, they get that platform for their suffrage work because we know how hard family suffrage and local suffrage researchers work out there. So you're going to be fully credited, you'll be platformed for every bit of information, photographs, etc., that you give to us. So, of course, I've got to urge you, please visit the website. Please try to get involved if you can. Um, we really want to hear from you. And there's so many different ways you can get involved. You can submit a campaigner, of course, um, but you may see one on the map that's already in your town. If you can add more material about them, that would be fantastic. Send, us to send it to us, we want to hear from you. Also, you know, you might be a keen photographer. Um, there might be a house on your map that you know still survives today. If you can get out there and take a photograph of it and send it to us, we'd love to receive it. So please do visit us, get involved. Um, certainly as a hand back to Sarah, I know that the two main speakers tonight, of course, Margaret and Claire, both did that very thing. They contacted us, they got involved, and we're so grateful for some of the fabulous things that they've already shared with us, and I know they're going to share with you tonight. Um, so on that note, um, I'm going to hand back to Sarah, our chair. Thank you so much, Tara. And I'd just like to echo what Tara has said about we've reclaimed some fabulous stories from across the country already, um, and we'd love to add more because it's really important that um, Everybody, every suffrage story is, is remembered. Everyone who was active in the campaign gets their story out there. We want to map them uh, partly to commemorate their, their efforts, but also we know that the resources used widely by schools and by local history groups to publicise what was happening in the suffrage movement on the ground um, in their own community, in your own communities. And uh, for us, that's our, our sort of greatest um, achievement. Really, is is to is is to demonstrate that it wasn't just Emmeline Pankhurst, Emily Wilding Davison, people in London, but it was people across the across the country. I'm really glad now to hand over to um, Margaret Scott. Um, and having talked about Emily Wilding Davison just there, I think she's going to give us quite a different perspective <laughs> um, on Emily. Um, Margaret's a former teacher and she's a local and family history researcher who lives in Long Horsley in Northumberland. Now, this is uh, the place where Emily Wilding Davison's mother, I believe, ran the local village shop. Um, so, uh, so a sort of slightly different take on Emily, who is mostly, I think, famous for um, her intervention in the Derby, but also um, for hiding in the House of Commons during the 1911 census um, uh, to, to avoid being uh, recorded. Um, Margaret is the author of Emily's Long Horsley, which records Emily's life in Northumberland. But she's also discovered some suffrage campaigners in her own family. Um, and she's going to share all this information with us. So I'm going to hand over to Margaret now. Thank you very much for joining us, Margaret. OK, thank you. Thank you and welcome everyone. Um, my, I'm Margaret Scott. I've been involved in local and family history for many years and, and tonight I'm talking about research into my family history and discovering women suffrage workers in my own family. I'll also talk about the book I've written um, as Sarah said, on suffragette Emily Wilding Davison and her connections to Long Horsley in Northumberland, where I now live. So, um, next slide, please. Oh, and the next one. Right, family history means just what it says. And so I'll begin with a brief introduction to my family all from North Lincolnshire. Here's my mum and dad's wedding photograph, Ellen and Fred Bradley. I'm here with mum and dad and my brother John at Cleethorpes. I've used photographs, family tales, Bibles, postcards of local places to build my family's story. And local history collections, newspapers, trade directories, books of old photographs and childhood reminiscences all add to the background. Site visiting is so rewarding, tracing in their footsteps, walking up and down their local high street, seeing the church they attended were baptised or married in, 
Looking round great churchyards to find gravestones prove you're a real family historian. In these difficult times, Google Earth and Street View give a great opportunity to do a site visit from your armchair. Next, please. More family photos, moving left to right, grandma and granddad, Elijah and Maud, then Maud's mother, Ada, and then uh, Ada's father, John Shipham, who was a baker. And my earliest photo of a Shipham is Edward and Hannah, John's father and mother, uh, taken in the late 1870s. The Shippams lived in Gainsborough, Lincolnshire, and are descended from a long line of shoemakers and early Wesleyans. This was a real surprise, as I thought the whole family belonged to the Church of England, and learned that my ancestors' religion had a big part to play in their lives. For this talk, I'm concentrating on Ada Shippam's generation and one of her second cousins, Frank. Next, please. Here are Ada and, uh, and Frank Shippham at the bottom of the page. Most of the information on this short family tree came from parish registers uh, available at the local archives office uh, and online. And a really significant part of the Shippen family history was this link to the Wesleyans and its opportunities for education. This information is also available at archives offices and Methodist publications. The Wesleyan educated Shippens became teachers, missionaries in India and Ceylon, Wesleyan ministers and business people. One of Ada's second cousins was Frank Percy Bevel Shippen. Frank had obtained a first uh, class degree in classics at Trinity College, Cambridge in 1892 and became a schoolmaster and later a school inspector. I found quite a lot about Frank and his wife, Elizabeth Close Shippen, the marriage birth of their three children, um, and their addresses in London from newspaper announcement, announcements. I checked the original parish registers for the marriage and baptisms. Be careful if you use a transcript because sometimes there might be something else at the bottom of the page which hasn't been transcribed. And I've used probate registers for dates and executors. Um, wills are excellent, but I haven't used these for the Shippums yet. Next, please. The 1911 census is a mine of information and here shows Frank Shippham in Lewisham, a school inspector with his eight-year-old daughter, Monica. And this was the first census where the form was filled in by the householder and not the census enumerator. Frank, instead of describing himself as head of the household, said he was husband of the occupier. So that's unusual and made me a bit curious. And his wife Elizabeth wasn't at home. Where was she and the other two children? Next, please. The breakthrough came by typing close Shippham into the internet. Christopher Close Shippham, age two, popped up in the 1911 census at Hove, Sussex. Next, please. I've transcribed the census form. Uh, Christopher was staying with his grandmother and aunts together with his brother, Hilary, age six. And there emerged this hotbed of women's suffrage at 48 Rutland Gardens Hove. So exciting. Prudence Close was head of the household and calls herself mother. Her sister Naomi Isaac, then Evelyn and Ethel Close, her daughters, and even the Swiss servant Jean all described themselves as suffrage workers. Next, please. In the infirmity col column of the census, usually reserved for someone with a disability, they wrote disenfranchised. 
So pro-women suffrage workers, as we've heard, were encouraged to make the feeling seen about the cause on the census form. But this itself was an act of rebellion against the authorities. Prudence Close, his other daughters, Kate and Elizabeth Close Shippen, Frank's wife, evaded the census. It would be really interesting to find out where they went. Have another look at your census returns for 1911 and see if you can spot who's missing. The wife, mother, sister, may be visiting relatives or they may be ev evading the census. Next. I concentrated on Frank and his wife Elizabeth who were living at Embleton Road, Lewisham and found they were very active in women's suffrage from around 1908. I used newspaper reports and discovered Votes for Women reported that Elizabeth gave a talk on the higher education of women in 1909 at the local women's social and political union group. Frank and Elizabeth spoke regularly at suffrage meetings in South London and were extremely active from 1910 in the newly formed Church League for Women's Suffrage. I hadn't realised there were so many organisations and newspapers involved. The Vote, the Common Cause and the Church League all featured Frank, Elizabeth or her sisters at various times. Next, please. The newspaper of the Church League for Women's Suffrage featured them most widely as Elizabeth Close Shippen and her sister Kate Close were both secretaries for their local branches of the Church League, Greenwich and Lewisham and Brighton and Hove respectively. Their sisters Ethel and Evelyn also served on the Brighton and Hove Church League committee. We can occasionally glean some personal information from these reports as they were written in their own words. For example here, Elizabeth stepped down as secretary for a while uh, due to indifferent health. The branch reports give information about new members, speakers, arrangements for meetings, etc. And these cover the whole country. These strong women had many other interests and belonged to a host of other organisations. The Close Sisters were active members of the Children's Union of the Church of England Waifs and Strays Society. In the Church League, they heard or gave talks on many subjects, prison reform, the disabilities of married women, dangers in pleasure resorts for girls, public morals and the nation's health, religion and labour and infant mortality. And these organisations may have their own archives to discover more information. Next, please. The Women's Library at the LSE holds a comprehensive collection of material on women's suffrage, including this photo found by Claire of the, Ch for, of the Church League for Women's Suffrage General Council meeting held in Brighton in July 1913. It was organised by Kate Close and her sisters, Kate and Elizabeth and daughter Monica are on this photo outlined in yellow. Monica is the child seated, Elizabeth is behind her in the big hat and Kate is behind Elizabeth. It's been absolutely fantastic to match faces to family names. So the Shipham and the Close Sisters stories are now on the Mapping Women's Suffrage website and Frank as well. This is the culmination of my Shipham family research from a few years ago and still there's more to find. Next please. 
The discovery of suffrage workers in my own family led me to complete a po project with Long Horsley Local History Society in Northumberland, which we'd been contemplating for a long time. Uh, a history of one of the most famous suffragettes, Emily Wilding Davison, from a local perspective and using original documents. So the Church League Brighton meeting photo was taken just a few weeks after Emily was killed at the Derby. She was herself a member of the Church League, as well as the Women's Social and Political Union, and we can only imagine what delegates must have been feeling at that time in July 1913. Next, please. Although Emily Davison was living in London, she called Long Horsley her home. Her mother, Margaret Davison, ran the village shop from uh, 1901 to her death in 1918. Uh, so the this photo dates from about 1930 with the shop on the left. It's remained a shop until quite recently. And Emily visited her mother regularly for holidays and then for rest and recuperation after being imprisoned and force fed so many times. Next, please. Uh, as Sarah said, um, this is the census form for Emily Davison. So after the excitement of finding my own suffrage workers, uh, in Brighton and Hove, I started my research into Emily and here she is in the broom cupboard of the Houses of Parliament. It's really interesting this form because she gives false information to the clerk of works who filled in the form. Her surname is spelled wrongly, her occupation is out of date, her birthday place is given as Long Horsley when actually she was born in Blackheath in London. And I like the column where the clerk of works has described her as head of the household, actually head of the broom cupboard, cupboard. And she described it later as a thrilling adventure. Next, please. Uh, the handwriting on the census isn't Emily's. And we know that because the, our history society has an original example of Emily's handwriting. This is a page from an autograph book still in private hands in the village. This was written by Emily in January 1913 and shows some of her favourite phrases and very difficult handwriting to uh, decipher. Deeds not words, rebellion against tyrants is obedience to God. Who would be free must strike the first blow. Next, please. Uh, this is a page from one of Emily's notebooks, uh, a draft letter to the Newcastle Chronicle written in autumn 1912 after she had been in prison for six months. The original has been deposited in the Emily Wilding Davison archive in the LSE, but Long Horsley History Society has copies. The Emily Wilding Davison archive also contains two very poignant letters from Emily's mother posted from the village. We were privileged to have access to these and other genuine artifacts, Emily's purse, race card, and return train ticket from Epsom. Northumberland archives hold all oral recordings of villagers. One's a neighbour of Margaret Davison who has strong views about people like Emily, who in her opinion were well educated but wasting their talents on the cause. Next, please. When doing research, it's really important to share and communicate with other people. This prayer book and birthday book emerged after I made an appeal at the History Society and in the village newsletter for any information hiding about Emily Davison in preparation for writing the book about her life in Northumberland. And Emily was the owner of these small books, a prayer book and a birthday book, when she was a pupil at Kensington High School for Girls. 
Uh, they contain names of family members and school friends. And they were rescued uh, from a bonfire in Margaret Davison's garden in 1918 and kept all that time by uh, one of the villagers and now on display in Long Horsley. So a great discovery. Next, please. Long Horsley is always remembered, Emily, and the book gave us a really good opportunity to recognise this from the WI Putting Flowers on a Grave in nearby Morpeth, plays, processions, exhibitions. And this photo shows the unveiling of a plaque on the shop wall in 1993 to commemorate Emily, Emily's life and connection to the village. Next, please. The outcome of all these village stories, memories, artifacts, and land valuation, tax documents, census, census returns is the book, Emily's Long Horsley, published in 2018. It establishes and proves Emily firmly in Long Horsley, shows her close relationship to her mother, and emphasizes her importance to future generations. It's been fascinating and rewarding to find so much out about these remarkable men and women of my family and village, from Wesleyan missionaries to active members of public health boards, to suffragettes, to teachers, to housewives holding everything together. I hope you, you enjoy researching as much as I've done and have a go yourselves at writing your family story. Thank you. Right, back to Sarah. Thanks so much, Margaret. Just a fascinating um, story from your own family, but also bringing us probably a, a, a hidden history of Emily Wilde and Davidson. So she's so well known for um, that iconic um, trip to the Derby where she lost her life. Um, and also, as I said, for, for some of her other exploits. Um, but we forget her local roots and her local origins. And, um, you know, it's really important to to remember those and to, to give the sort of full picture of, of all of these suffrage activists. And I just wanted also to pick up on um, the highlight that you highlighted the importance of the 1911 census. And as you said, it's a fascinating document because it's filled in by householders themselves and they often use it as a as a way of protesting against the government so you could see that in in um in the clerk of works entry on behalf of emily um but if you look if you go to the mapping women's suffrage project you see so many more of these stories um and what fascinates me is the sort of dialogue that was going on which was unknown to both those filling in the census and in enumerators um, you know, the civil servants were really frustrated with the suffrage uh, activists for not filling in the forms properly. <laughs> uh, that they annotate, you know, with their own comments and what uh, you've already alluded to, one of the villagers um, uh, thinking that Emily was wasting her time um, fighting for the suffrage. And you get that, those sort of stories in the, yeah. on the pages of the census often. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a really important source and it just, brings home to you that the sort of tension that was going on at the time. So thank you very much. I want to move now to Claire Witchbold's um, uh, talk and she's going, she's a former archaeologist who now works at the Courtyard Centre for the Arts um, and she became interested in women's suffrage um, or it says here when she was chair of the Hereford Three Choirs Festival but I'm, I'm assuming she may have been interested before. <laughs> And uh, the Three Choirs Festival celebrated the Votes for Women centenary in 2018 through music, talks and exhibitions. Um, Claire, like Margaret, is currently writing her own, uh, her own book, um, looking at um, the suffrage history of Herefordshire. And we are awaiting that with great interest, Claire. Um, but I'm going to hand over to you now for you to illuminate um, some of this sort of lost Herefordshire history of the women's suffrage campaign. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, well, good evening from Hereford. Um, I am quite late to the suffrage story. Um, I 
started researching quite late. And as uh, Sarah said, I was until recently the chair of the Hereford Three Choirs Festival. Now, I was actually chairman. And if Florence Canning, who was a suffragette, could use chairman for the Church League for Women's Suffrage, I think it's good enough for me. I used to work at Hereford Cathedral and I was involved in the Eastern Cloisters project that was funded by the Heritage Lottery. And in early 2018, Sarah Hollingdale and I, we were looking for ways to showcase the historic role of women at the cathedral. Because of course, until not that many years ago, it was very male dominated. Can I have the first slide, please? So here I am um, channeling my hitherto untapped suffragette uh, during the Three Choirs Festival in 2018. We commemorated the representation of the People's Act and we had music by women composers. And you'll be pleased to know that Ethel Smythe's Mass in D was one of the major works. And we had a new composition by the young composer Hannah Kendall as well. Now, at the same time, there was an exhibition at the Hereford Archives and Records Centre, and it had a number of really fascinating items on display from their own collections. And there were a few familiar names of women involved in the suffrage movement. There was an image of Gladys Keevil at a meeting in Hereford in May 1908. And there were letters from Mrs Pankhurst to Beatrice Parby, who was a local suffrage activist. Can I have the next slide, please? So this item was on display and it was an invitation card for a meeting that was sent to Beatrice, Miss Parby and friends. But of course, what intrigued us was who was Mrs Davis of number seven, the Cloisters? She didn't appear in any of the cathedral records, but I made really good use of Ancestry and the British newspaper archive websites and found an awful lot more out about Ethel and her husband, the Reverend George Herbert Davis. He was a minor canon at the cathedral. And I was gonna mention a few useful top tips. And my first top tip is with a name like Davis, make sure you look at Davies as well. I had an awful lot of confusion with that as I was doing my research. The other thing that I found difficult was trying to track down people in the local newspapers. After 1909, the Herefordshire Press was not really well disposed to the suffrage movement and gave short shrift, if any mention at all, to meetings and events. So I was able to use other online resources and it turned out that Ethel was the local secretary to the WSPU. She evaded the 1911 census. She organised a suffrage stall at the 1912 Hereford May Fair and protested in Hereford Crown Court about the treatment of women being subjected to criminal proceedings, most notably in February 1915, when the local visiting circuit judge commented that he felt sorry for her husband, the vicar. Little did Justice Avery know that George had shared a platform with the Pankhurst, participated in a deputation to Downing Street about the Cat and Mouse Act, was a leading member of the Church League for Women's Suffrage and was one of the clergymen who officiated at Emily Wilding Davidson's funeral service at St George's Church in Bloomsbury. So having found Ethel and George and knowing about Beatrice Parby, this got us thinking, who else was there in Hereford who played a role in the suffrage movement and we could publicise them quickly and quirkily, but with a good story? So in conjunction with the Three Choirs Festival in July 2018, we created a project called Violet Plaques. May I have the next slide, please? And this was great because we put uh, temporary plaques around the city, giving brief details about men and women who'd been involved in the suffrage campaign. We had something on the cathedral website. We did a social media campaign as well. And my little suffragette that was a present from another colleague visited all the violet plaques. And as you can see, we did tell both sides of the story uh, when it came to putting them up around the city. So we had the Davises, we had Florence Canning, uh, we had Charles Anthony Jr. and the Bishop of Hereford, John Percival, just to name a few of them. Can I have the next slide, please? And my second top tip is if you're looking for clergymen in the census records, you'll often find that they aren't at home. They might be away on parish duties or visitations like Bishop John Percival. 
1911, as you can see here, he was actually at the vicarage in uh, Much Wenlock in Shropshire. And he was there rather than at the Bishop's Palace in Hereford. And then the other thing to mention about this as well is that you'll often find that diocesan boundaries aren't the same as county boundaries. So when you are looking for clergymen, you might find that they're a bit further afield. Hereford Diocese, for example, covers parts of Worcestershire, a few parishes in Wales, and goes quite a long way into Shropshire. Anyway, going back to uh, what, what we were doing, after the mini project of Violet Plaques, I was completely hooked and decided to carry on looking at some of the individuals we'd found through further research. It was obvious that in our haste, some of the research was a bit wrong. So I needed to get myself to Herefordshire Archives and Records Census to look at the primary sources of information. And by this time, I'd come across Mapping Women's Suffrage and was quite keen with Tara's encouragement and support to get some of the Herefordshire individuals on the map. And I'd absolutely no idea about the voyage of discovery I was going to go on. Next slide, please. So the first thing I did was to put suffrage into the Herefordshire Archives Index search engine, and this came up. Uh, the pencil notes are my, what, A, eh? what on earth's going on, when I finally looked into folder BH29, and I'll come on to that later. Currently, Herefordshire Archives are changing to Epexio, and records are being gradually transferred from the index search. And so at the moment, search terms don't always pick things up. My next top tip comes directly from Rhys Griffiths, who's one of the archivists at Herefordshire Archives. And he says, think laterally when you put search terms into search engines. And that's another top tip in itself. Make sure you do talk to local archivists. They're individuals with a real wealth of knowledge about what's going on. And so I'd like to go to a few stories about some of the people from Herefordshire involved in the suffrage movement. Next slide, please. This is Beatrice Palby. She was the eldest daughter of a liberal politician and Methodist preacher. And the family story goes that she and her three sisters were all suffragettes. It turns out from investigating her own papers held at Herefordshire Archives that Beatrice was the most active of the sisters in her involvement with the suffrage movement. She was actually a school teacher at Burnley Grammar School who had to give up her career and to return to Hereford after a breakdown in 1902. Her mental health was fragile, and from reading the asylum records, it appears, I think she was bipolar, but she threw herself into campaigning for votes for women. She was cared for by her family, she had no income, and she never actually joined the WSPU. However, she was corresponding with Mrs Pankhurst and she was tasked with organising the Hereford meetings in May 1908, when Gladys Keevil was travelling across the region, drumming up support for the Hyde Park demonstration on the 21st of June. Next slide, please. This photograph shows Gladys Keevil on a wagon speaking to a crowd in St Peter's Square in Hereford with a stern looking woman, not Beatrice, behind her. At the bottom of the photograph is a man with an official looking cap and he's at the bottom right, if you can see him. I spoke to a friend who's a senior police officer and a keen police historian, and he confirmed that the man is in fact a police inspector. So he would have been sent by the local chief constable, Frank Richardson, to keep an eye on the militant Gladys. So there we have another top tip. Look really closely at photographs both original ones and digital ones, you never know what you might find. So carefully examining photographs brings me next to Florence Canning, eldest daughter of the Vicar of St. Paul's in Tupsley, Hereford. Next slide, please. Even though um, Florence was a member of the WSPU, the Church League, the Conservative Union Women's, oh yeah, I'll say that again, the Conservative Unionist Women's Franchise Association. She participated in uh, tax resistance league protests 
and evaded the 1911 census. She's not particularly well known as a figure in the suffrage movement. She does appear in a number of photographs taken by Colonel Blathwaite at Bath Easton, including this glorious picture of her wearing a headscarf. And I decided to see if I could find Florence in other photographs online. Now, Margaret's already mentioned the Women's Library and the fantastic collections that they hold in terms of photographs. And of course, there's a really great physical archive at LSE as well. Um, the Flickr collection of photographs um, has got memorabilia, banners, pamphlets, posters relating to the suffrage campaign. So I went through the lot and at the moment there's a thousand and six images and even if you're not actually looking for somebody in particular it's a really great thing to do. Can I have the next picture please? And so this is the slide uh, that uh, Margaret showed you already and in the middle of the picture hatless is uh, Florence Canning. The picture was actually taken by a professional photographer called Muriel Darton, who came from London. She did this main photograph and she also took pictures of some of the clergymen as well. Now, I really like this picture. You know, there they are with all their wonderful hats. But what makes this picture even more significant are the two Indian women seated at the bottom right. They're actually sitting on either side of Mrs. Gertrude Hinscliffe, wife of Claude Hinscliffe, founder of the Church League. I'm really indebted to Gillian Murphy at the Women's Library and Sumita Mukherjee from the University of Bristol for their help in pursuing my research to identify who they are. One of them is Cecilia Bonaggi and probably her sister, Nalini, who were both involved in the suffrage movement. So this discovery led to a lot of interest online and uh, an article in the BBC History magazine. Next slide, please. So returning to Florence, sadly, she didn't live to see women get the vote. She died in Brighton on Christmas Eve 1914 of cancer and was buried back in Hereford at St Paul's Church in Tupsley alongside other family members. And a future project I do hope to pursue is to crowdfund a restoration of her grave. Next slide, please. The final person I want to talk about is the wonderfully named Constance Chellingworth Radcliffe Cook. Constance was the oldest daughter of MP Charles Radcliffe Cook, who owned Helen's Manor at Much Markle in Herefordshire. She was a keen local historian, undertook extensive linguistics research, was proficient in shorthand, and had a passion for home economics, improving nutrition and food education. In 1911, she was working at Elise Randall's School of Cookery in Eastbourne, and on the census, she described herself rather archly as a social reformer. Next slide, please. She developed and made a cooking box, uh, not a hay box. She was very at great pains to point that out during the First World War. She published a how-to guide on making the box together with a set of recipes, and it was actually reprinted in the Second World War as well. What is less well known, in fact unknown, is that Constance was a suffragette, an active member of the WSPU. When she died in 1963 in Much Markle at her cottage, Monk's Walk, she was unmarried and had no close relatives. She bequeathed all her 30 years worth of linguistics research to SOAS, but the papers weren't accepted there and found their way back to Hereford via an incredibly circuitous route via Keele University. So there's 13 boxes of linguistics research, a future job for somebody else to do. Um, her local history research was catalogued and forms the mainstay of the archives for Much Markle Parish and the Helens Estate. All her personal papers and photographs were gathered up and also given to Herefordshire archives and were uncatalogued, forming around 10 boxes of material. However, some years before her death, she separately sent two packages to the archives in Hereford and the contents of these were catalogued, sort of, and appear on the list I showed you earlier. One folder had the suffragette roll of honour and a notebook of speeches, much of which are in shorthand together with a typescript of a speech that Constance gave about the suffrage movement to the Methodist Sisterhood at Fernhill Heath in early 1914. 
So this brings me to the other fold, a BH29, which turned out to be a gold mine of treasures. There was a copy of the suffragette newspaper with the raided headline. Next slide, please. There was a length of suffragette ribbon. And moving on again, please, to the next slide. There was a photograph of Christabel Pankhurst with a small ribbon attached. There was a copy of Votes for Women from June 1911 with Constance's note that she was part of the Welsh contingent at the Empire pageant. Next slide, please. But most remarkable of all were the notes written by Constance about her involvement in the suffrage movement, describing the anti-suffragist views of her father, participating in meetings for salt workers' wives with Bertha Brewster at Droitwich in Worcestershire after the election riots in February 1910, attending Hyde Park events, speaking at Tooting on behalf of the WSPU. The list goes on. Further research looking through the papers revealed that Constance was spending time on the Isle of Wight each winter and then was back home in Herefordshire in summer when the weather was better. And after the Second World War, she became a speaker for the WEA in Ryde. And I suddenly realised all these things, the ribbon, the newspaper, were her props for her talks. And here I am now using them all these years later. Next slide, please. Uh, one incident that does deserve mention is about a poster parade. Um, the chief constable wasn't very happy about it. Um, Frank Richardson wanted to arrest the women, uh, but they didn't want to get arrested because they were wearing their best clothes. So Canon Davis took them through the back streets of Hereford to the railway station to avoid them being taken into custody. Now, using the British newspaper archives, it's been possible to track down the poster parade to Herefordshire Suffragette Week in October 1913, but sadly there's no mention of the encounter with Chief Constable Richardson. Um, and of course, this is another good thing as well, a top tip. Cross-check the original information with newspapers and published sources, and hopefully you might be able to get some of the undated things dated. So, I'm still cataloguing Constance's per personal papers. Next slide, please. And there's all sorts of things still there to look at. There's letters from individuals such as Maud Royden, May Havers, Violet Bland, and things like this as well, the programme for the Women's Coronation Procession. Constance was also a member of the Fabian Society, Women's Cooperative Guild, Women's Institute, and the Independent Labour Party. She was also a committed pacifist and in 1961 organised an art exhibition on behalf of CND in conjunction with the Three Choirs Festival. So that kind of brings me neatly back round to the start. It's been a really great opportunity to be able to share some of my findings and a few top tips. And I'd like to finish with a quote from a letter that Gladys Keeville sent to Beatrice Palby about the Hereford meetings. She remarked, it will be hard work but glorious. Thank you. Thanks so much, Claire. And um, like Margaret, sort of shining a light on a real, a really hidden history of uh, women's suffrage, uh, in this case in Herefordshire, but also Shropshire and, and Sussex and elsewhere. Um, so thank you for that. I think um, for me, uh, both your talks emphasise the importance of religion and suffrage, which is often forgotten in our sort of quite secular age now, um, but also the role of men. Um, you know, you, you've both highlighted um, the importance of some of the male suffrage activists, including um, bishops and vicars, which we might not expect to be on the front line. Um, we're nearing the end, but we do have a, quite an interesting question um, that's come in from Rory. And I just uh, wondered, um, Tara might want to answer this. Um, so can I, it, it's about the success that the map has had so far at diversifying our understanding of suffrage history. Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question, Rory. I mean, I think obviously we're, we're still in the early stages really in terms of what is quite an ambitious project and what we hope to achieve as we get towards 2028 for that sort of suffrage centenary celebration. But I think even in the pockets of local history and family history research, the wonderful examples that sort of Margaret and Claire have given us tonight, I think what has been revealed is 
as Sarah was just talking about there from Claire's talk, how many more men were involved in the movement than we expected, even from these small snapshots within sort of local towns and villages that we've been uh, fortunate enough to receive so far. I mean, I know Claire talked about some there in Herefordshire, but I think, you know, Sarah will remember when we did our initial sort of pilot schemes in Warwickshire, how we also came across quite a few clergymen, actually, that are involved, um, you know, quite prominently, actually, in suffrage campaigning in Warwickshire too, which, which we didn't really expect to, to discover. And also their more sort of passive roles in many ways, sort of attending coffee mornings and meetings, but nevertheless still being seen to support their wives and daughters um, in, in sort of campaigning for female suffrage. I think class elements also we've come across, um, you know, we've, we've sort of come across sort of, you know, very, very sort of um, sort of poor working class women from very um, um, sort of, you know, sort of struggling backgrounds, if you like, who will still find that time and commitment and passion um, to work for the vote, to argue for the vote in different ways. And very much at the other end of the spectrum, we've come across ladies um, who've, you know, sort of been in very privileged position, but have still fought for the same thing. Um, I think Margaret, uh, I'm sorry, um, Claire's um, photograph, um, where she um, highlighted the two sort of Indian ladies that have sort of sparked a whole kind of debate about diversity in the suffrage campaign was really fascinating. And obviously we always, always hope and, and, and want to discover um, more sort of ethnic diversity within the campaign, but we have to put that within the realistic historical context of, of the time that we're talking about. But yeah, I mean, I think so far from the, the bits of local research that we've, we've, we've sort of been privileged enough to receive, um, I think, you know, it really bodes well for, really changing our understanding of some of the patterns of the class and the genders that participated and also the broad ways in which people participated. This wasn't all about suffragettes and their dramatic deeds as important as they were. It was also about campaigning at everyday level in the community with coffee mornings, with afternoon teas, with just getting people on side and educating them to understand why giving women the vote was so important, not just for women, but for family life and for everyone. Great, thanks very much, Tara. Um, I think we're nearly at the end, but I just wanted to conclude by thanking um, all our speakers, Tara, Margaret and Claire, for their fascinating insights. And I think you'll all agree this has been a fabulous launch event. Um, you can go to the Mapping Women's Suffrage website every day this week to discover more hidden stories from the women's suffrage campaign. Um, we're going to um, launch these as resources. So we're starting with Vicky, Igelkovsky Broad from the National Archives is going to focus on the 1911 census, which we, we've um, talked about a little bit tonight, followed by Gillian Murphy of the Women's Library, um, who's going to talk about sex and suffrage. Then Tara and me are going to, to look at music and the suffrage movement. Then Prime sort of Coventry Digital is going to talk about his work for Coventry City of Culture, and he's developing um, a suffrage walk based on the Mapping Women's Suffrage Project. Um, and then finally this week, um, Jennifer Godfrey is going to share her stories of mapping women's suffrage and um, research in Kent. Uh, but next Saturday, we're having a final um, wrapping up event, which is going to be really exciting. And I hope you can all join us for that. Um, we're, we're delighted that Helen Pankhurst, the great granddaughter of Emmeline Pankhurst and the granddaughter of Sylvia Pankhurst is going to join us along with Hannah Squire and Helen Bratt Witten of the National Trust. And together we're going to explore the legacies of the suffrage movement and what it means today. You can submit questions to Helen Pankhurst via the Mapping Women's Suffrage um, website. So we'd encourage you to do that. And thank you for joining us. And we're really grateful um, for your input tonight. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the week. <laughs>